All right. We are live with Tess Tevez. I can't wait to tell you all about her. So we're going to just check the live connection. We are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and inside of Tess's private Facebook group. My name is Andrea Wilson Woods, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cancer University. Please use this time, everybody, to check, make sure we're live. I'm also a patient advocate, author, speaker, and podcaster. I had the extreme pleasure of interviewing Tess on the Cancer Youth Thrivers podcast, and that episode will be out later this year, but I'm thrilled to have her back today. So Tess is an occupational therapist, somatic sexologist, and she is fighting stage three breast cancer. Personally experiencing the severe impact treatments have had on her intimacy and how top often this topic is ignored. Tess's goal is to help as many people as she can and to support everyone impacted by cancer. We are talking about Tess's book today, A Better Normal, Your Guide to Rediscovering Intimacy After Cancer, and I'm so, so excited. We will drop the link in the chat. Tess, thank you so much for coming on and talking about your book. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. <laughs> Good All morning. Right. Good afternoon yeah. where you are. Good afternoon. Good, Good morning. Let's <laughs> see. We're live on LinkedIn for sure. All right. I'm going to keep going. So I'm unable to see the Facebook live. Okay. Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> Someone let us know in the chat. <laughs> All right. This is one of my favorite sections from Tessa's book. What am I? We're not supposed to talk about it. You can't have too much of it. You can't have too little of it. It's used in nearly all marketing to sell, but it's never presented accurately in the media. It's a part of human life. Social media platforms shut you down for talking about it. People who are different, unwell, older, living with disability, are of different cultures and ethnicities, are assumed to not have it or to want it. We receive no education on it, yet we're supposed to be magically be good at it, and we're supposed to always want it. And then she adds, yep. That would be sex. <laughs> yeah. So tell How us, can you tell us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was amazing. Um, so tell us what it is that you do. Oh, big question. <laughs> um, so occupational therapists are, we're functional. So in non-English speaking countries, we're called functional therapists. And we just look at the things that people do day to day. So showering, dressing, cooking, catching a bus, um, or sex. Um, and so as an OT, I would include sexuality in my work in spinal cord injury and brain injury. And that I was also at the time a sexuality communication and consent educator for about a decade in the um, Melbourne, Australia community and now global online. Uh, and then I was diagnosed with cancer and I experienced the oh god so many side effects um sexually on oh, just like everything but I had no one to turn to no one would talk to me about it no one would help me through it and I had to be my own sex therapist during treatments which was not great and so then during treatments I um studied somatic sexology because I was like you know what if I'm the one with all the training and I'm struggling this much I can't imagine how hard this is for everybody else so that was my motivator. Um, yeah, and so now I just support people with disability as well. I work in sexuality and disability as well as sexuality and cancer. Um, and I just try and help people access better quality of life, um, loving relationships, connection to themselves, more like self-confidence. Sexuality is a big, big, big topic. So, I, um, yeah, I do a lot. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm, and I'm so excited to talk about it with you today. So if you look in the comments, I dropped a link to Tessa's book, A Better Normal, Your Guide to Rediscovering Intimacy After Cancer. But as she just said, she supports a lot of different people, not just people who are currently fighting cancer. So Tess, I want you to tell us what is the difference between desire, libido, and arousal? <sighs> I know you can talk for hours, but... <laughs> Um, so desire, um, so think of desire as the, the wanting, you know, the, um, the lusty feelings that we have. So I call it like desire and libido I use interchangeably for each other. You know, it's that, that wanting. And arousal 
is what happens when we're we're in pleasure. You know, so we could our pupils dilate, our, our breathing increases, we have more sensitive skin. Maybe we do things like lubricate or have um, uh, we get hard or wet, like words that are commonly used. So that's the arousal responses, but it's very different to the the wanting. So I. Libido and desire is wanting and arousal is enjoying. And there's a big difference. Arousal, you can, it, it's very physiological. It's also neurological. Everything is neurological because our brain is our largest sex organ. But the desire and libido is particularly uh, all reliant on what's happening in here. It's not really about what's down there. And so people <laughs> get that a little. <laughs> and it's very important because you can rehabilitate libido and you can rehabilitate arousal but you, it's very important to know the difference between the two and how understanding how they work in the body oh that is so well said and we are taking questions toward the end but go ahead and comment uh, someone has already said they're really looking forward to reading your book yes ah. read it read it it is a very easy read and test breaks down things and also she's just really damn funny so i'm saving my favorite line for a little bit later <laughs> um so tell us what you meant by this line i thought this was a, actually a really beautiful line where you say intimacy and affection are small giants so I, I, uh, I'm very big on the visual analogies, <laughs> especially in my book. And people, so intimacy just drops off. Um, it's normal. We're fighting cancer and look at what treatments do to us. And, uh, you know, and as well for the people around us who are on treatments, it's really scary and stressful. So it's very normal for things like intimacy and affection to kind of drop off, especially for partners who are really scared of touching their partners because they don't want to hurt them. You know, maybe there's surgery sites, radiotherapy burns, chemo, sensitivity. But without that affection and intimacy, it's very difficult to want things like sex. And so I call intimacy and affection like a bridge, you know. So you've got not having sex, having sex, but like, what's in between, you know, and to want sex, the wanting, that libido, we want to feel loved, we want to feel attractive, we want to feel safe and we want to feel that connection with ourselves or with a partner. So I call them small giants because I, I just honestly just you could ignore the sex to get to the sex. You actually want to reconnect <laughs> with, you want to reconnect with the people around, you know, and I, I'm, it's so, so little like kiss. Have a good night kiss every night, you know, something as small as that. Or, um, you know, touch, hold hands or, or put someone, put your arm around someone in the kitchen and express, you know, words of love, you know, hey, I really love you, I just wanted to mm. share. And all of these little things, like they're so small, these little giants. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty powerful in the libido and intimacy recovery. And I just want to add, Tess has in her book, questions. So if you don't know how to phrase something or ask for something, she has lots and lots of questions, you know, words that you can use to ask for what you want. Now I, I wanted to... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I'm really proud of that. I think that that's one of the most useful... I mean, it's a very practical book. I'm an OT and a sexologist. It's very practical, but... What I noticed in when I was facilitating sexuality workshops was every time someone would put their hand up when I would say something like, yeah, all you need to do is communicate about this. And they're like, can you give me an example? And it yeah. was very helpful. The sentence strings, literal, like lists and lists of, for the people listening, like it's literally dot point quotes of how you can communicate intimately or with your healthcare professionals or with each other because um, we're not taught this. It's yeah. tricky. Yeah, you're right. We're not taught it. And you're yes, the sentence strings are incredibly helpful. I mean, this it is a very practical book and a very funny book. <laughs> so now I want to get on the topic of spontaneity versus intention. And before we went live, I told you that as a caregiver for my sister who battled cancer when she was a teenager and, and didn't um, survive. I was very intentional with her. I mean, I kept track of all her labs. I knew when she could go outside safely and see friends and be in the world. And I was very cognizant of that. So was she. And we planned everything around her health. 
So that part I understood, but then I started thinking about it when I was in my previous marriage and the thought to actually plan time to be intimate was, it was hard for both of us, but especially my now ex-husband, like he just didn't like this idea that we had, it had to be planned. Yeah. And so I would love for you to talk about that. Yeah, I hear a lot from clients and the people I support online. There's a lot of uh, grief around the spontaneity. And I'm Mm. not going to say to you that it's easy. It's loss. But different doesn't have to mean bad. So also think about when it was spontaneous. You know, maybe you were healthy. Maybe (laughs) you had more time on your hands. Maybe you had more energy and, you know, it was, it was easier to be spontaneous. You know, you're ripping each other's clothes off in the television commercial break. Like that's amazing. (laughs) That's wonderful. But without cancer, even just standard partnership life patterns, life gets in the way and the spontaneity does decrease. But with cancer treatments, I, I call it in, intentional. You know, it's not spontaneous sex, it's intentional sex. And, yeah, maybe you do need to organise it, but it also shows. So my, my partner and I say this all the time. We're like, I, I really miss you. I want to connect with you. I love you. Can we please organise a time where we're, we're really rested and we're there for each other? And I just like, oh, my God, it's so hot. <laughs> Like, yes, thank you for thinking about me. Thank you for wanting to be intimate and caring about when it's going to be right for me. Um, so it's it's intentional, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. You know, it shows caring. It shows love. And, and again, you know, I know that the spontaneity, it's, it's not going to be there. And that's okay. It, may, it might come back after treatments, but please don't feel like it's the end of your intimacy or the end of your sex, you know. Having a date night every week is it's pretty fun because you know how you when you meet someone and or you're dating and you've got that anticipation and the excitement, you know, it's the exact same thing. You're like, oh my God, I've got a date coming up with my partner. What are we gonna do? This is exciting. <laughs> you know, it's fun, you know. And all of, by the way, you know, people say like dating spontaneity. I'm like, no, it's not actually. Dating is extremely scheduled and planned. Oh yes. But it's exci- you know what I mean? That's so a good I'm point. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah. So I want to just mention something on the same topic where you say the assumption that we need to be intimate at the end of the day is ludicrous as that's generally when we are tired, the most tired. And and you talk about getting intimate before dinner. I could not agree with you more yeah. on this. Um, my partner knows late afternoon, especially if it's raining. Love it. Love it. But then you just have this line. I just want to share it because it made me laugh out loud. Why can't eating deep fried chicken in bed while watching Star Trek be good for our bodies? (laughs) Oh, that's I just want to give people exercise. (laughs) Yeah, I just want to give people a sense of the book is funny too. It's very helpful. It's a very how to, but it's very funny. And Uh I do understand we have people watching. I do understand if if you're shy about posting any Mm. questions or comments. Um, so be sure to get Tessa's book and reach out to her on Facebook and we will have links to all of that. But I do understand if you're a little shy. Yeah. So and that's actually the reason why I wrote it because people are scared to reach out. So you can read the book in the privacy of your own home. You know, it's for you, even under the covers, you can accidentally <laughs> leave it for your partner to read. Um, yeah, I, I wanted it to be able to accessible for the people that are still a bit embarrassed about it because we all are kind of, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Yeah. You know, actually on the topic of the book or the title, A Better Normal, tell us why you don't like that very overused oh. phrase, new normal. So I, I hate those words. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times, and it's funny with COVID, new normal is getting used a lot in Australia. Oh. I don't know if it is in the States. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, new normal. I I hand gesture here. Um, I, <laughs> like, what do you know? Hand gig. Um, I feel like when people say or healthcare professionals say, "Okay, so this is your new normal," they're kind of like, "Off you mm. go, deal with it. This is this is how Accept it's going it, to be. Move on. Suck it up." And and I'm like, "Oh, this is not good. Like, I I do not like this normal. This is not normal." Um, and and a lot of people who are having uh, intimacy 
struggles, post treatments, because it doesn't get talked about, they think that their struggles are unique to them alone Mm. and there's no support and there's no hope. And so they're suffering in silence, thinking that this is the new normal, but we can make it better. So it's kind of my little um, like annoyance in a very obvious way at a new normal because we actually can make it better, um, which is what the book is about. It's practical solutions. But, yeah, I um, I think a lot of people, we, we can especially um, are the non-active treatment. So I'm on hormone treatments right now and I'm struggling. Uh, in particular, I think people who are on the longer types of treatments, they're just told, yeah, this is your new normal, accept it. You're like, but yeah. this is horrible. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So that talk about what you mean by this. Remove the goal, remove mm. the pressure. Oh, you're really, really jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> um So this is going to sound really strange, but okay. So sexuality is pretty much neurological. Um, I've said this before. This is our largest sex organ, not what's down there. Um, We put a lot of pressure on ourselves around intimacy. And remember at the start, Andrea, how you were like, what am I? We can't talk about it, but we have to be good at it. And we have to want it all the time. And it's used to Um, sell everything. (laughs) Yeah, right. Everything. Everything. Oh, um, so I guess we're kind of there's this almost societal pressure on us to to want it all the time and be mm. good at it. Yeah. Um, but that should, I call it should brain, it it actually interferes with us at, us wanting it. And so I'm gonna use I'm gonna use Viagra as an example. Perfect example. So Viagra, people think that it's a pill for libido it's not libido was wanting viagra gets blood flow to a particular organ of the body it creates an arousal response but viagra doesn't work if you're not if you're anxious if you're stressed if you feel pressure and it just it's just perfect even with medication our brain is controlling our sex so when we feel pressured to want it or have it when we feel obligated or it feels like a chore, we're not going to want it. And that's actually going to neurologically disassociate our desire for sex, our our experience of it being a good thing. We're going to start to associate sex as something that is an obligation and pressure and we're just not going to want it. So if you remove that pressure, if you <laughs> if you take sex off the table for a little while, even if you're not having it right now, and I, I'm I'm being very generalist in the word sex sure. right now because it's huge but if you take it take it off the table even if you're not having it but actually saying okay for three weeks no sex but we're gonna touch and we're gonna kiss you remove the pressure and then what do you know because that that oh god where's this gonna go if I touch you you're gonna think I want sex I don't, I'm not gonna touch you because yeah. it, I'm not ready for that it hurts or I'm ashamed of my body all of these things, you're just getting rid of it. And it's amazing. Like it's the neurological recipe for for change, um, being relaxed, removing the anxieties and the stress and being able to enjoy touch. That was very long-winded and ranty. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was great. Like, oh, so much to say. <laughs> I, just, I just want to tell people too that I would recommend Tess's book for anyone, even if you are – physically in top shape if anyone if you're having difficult in a marriage that is sex starved um i just i wish this book had existed many 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 years ago um and a lot of it's just the way it tests puts things and that brings me to my next point um you many 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 times in many different ways say no pain no pain and you stress it over and over and over. And I would love for you to, as someone who has just dealt with pain, it's like, oh, you know, it's going to be painful. I'll, I'll get over it in a, you know, a minute or two maybe. Um, I really appreciate this. So I would love for you to talk about that. Yeah, I, I need to give credit to a different sex therapist. Um, I wish I coined that phrase. It's so, so clever. So you know the <laughs> phrase, no pain, no gain? Right you know it could could apply to going to the gym it applies for so much and actually when you think about it it's really really weird thing to 
to say to people, force yourself to hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? But um, when it comes to intimacy, it should never hurt, you know. Um, if it hurts, stop. And this goes back to, again, I'm a broken record, but the way our brain is wired around pleasure, just like that feeling like it's a chore or it's something you should do, if it hurts, you're not going to want it. But yeah. also you're doing more damage. You know, it depends on why it hurts. But particularly I'm going to refer to people, say, with vaginal atrophy or vaginismus. Um, oh, geez, all of it, vulvodynia. So in particular, we feel that we need to force ourselves to get through it. Some some clinicians tell their patients, use it or lose it. Um, <laughs> which is awful, um, that's actually a neuroscience phrase for neurological rehabilitation. I would explain that to my patients in the spinal cord injury ward eight times a day, but it's not musculoskeletal. And what people are doing is they feel like, you know, use it or lose it. They feel like, okay, my only choice is to force myself to have a very painful experience and to force my partner to cause me pain, and it's mm. very damaging. Now, it comes from the theory, well, the theory, the fact that blood flow is incredible for healing tissues. So, but you can get blood flow to the pelvis in many ways. You don't have to be penetrated. You can go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not causing you pain. Or maybe if you have bone pain, go for a very slow, gentle walk when it's like a nice temperature. But, you know, you could pleasure yourself externally. Um, you can have a bath, you know, and so I guess like the no pain, no pain thing is we don't want to do more damage, but we're also it's it's a stressful experience. It creates anxiety and it's and it hurts relationships, um, causing pain. It's, it's it's not good. So I guess when when you say, like, say you're you're intimate with someone and it hurts, people are really scared to like, oh, I like I have to keep going. We can't stop now. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can stop. Yeah. Just say things like, oh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. Do you mind passing the lube? Or, oh, hey, look, um, yeah, th th this is starting to feel a bit uncomfortable. Can I maybe offer you something with my hands or my mouth? You know, there's, there's alternatives. Or like, would you like to self-pleasure yourself while I kiss your body? You know, I want to keep being intimate with you, but it's, it's just a bit sore right now. Is there something else we can try? Again, that's the, the quotes in the book, you know, how to say these things. Um, but there's so many more possibilities and sex should never hurt. Blanket yeah. statement. I'm not big on generalizations, but that one I'm 100% on. Never, should never hurt. Oh, I love that. And I just know too many women who, and, and these are not women who've ever had cancer, but um, when they got into menopause, sex hurt. And so they just turn that part of their body off. Oh, and they, yeah. and I, I just, I, gosh, how can you do that? I mean, it's, it's like breathing, you know, it's part, it's part of who you are. So yeah. Um, yeah. I appreciate you, you saying that. And as you can see, she's already talking about lube. So she gives very practical tips. <laughs> so we're going to save my favorite line of the whole book is coming up <laughs> in a bit, but, um, but again, uh, Tessa's book is in the chat. We will put it afterwards in the notes, but if you have any comments or questions, I promise we will not call you out. So if you want to put a comment, question, and then, you know, if you mm -hmm. want to delete it later, go ahead. That's fine. Um, okay. So you have some super practical tips and this is one that really jumped out at me because I had never heard of it before. I never thought about it before. Mm -hmm. And let me pull that up. It's well, yeah, why you want to remove photos. Talk, talk about that. Because I'm me, I did a survey with <laughs> a lot of <laughs> cancer patients because I'm like, I need the data, I need the stats. Um, and I asked, I asked what's, what's what the number one thing you're struggling with? And about 73% of, it's only 250 people, small sample size, That's but 73%, yeah, said body image. Um, the changes in their body. And I'm not just referring to loss of hair and weight changes and scarring, but also loss of function. And uh, so in the book, I have a whole chapter on things that can help you improve or shift in a positive way how you feel about yourself. So 
the way we see ourselves impacts the way we feel about ourselves and the way we feel about ourselves impacts ha- how we interact with the world and the people around us and, and our self-confidence and self-esteem. Uh, but there's not much I really struggled to find resources on this top- topic. So I had this I had this light bulb moment. I, oh, Facebook, you know how Facebook shows you those you were doing this five years ago and I and I just, it was just this time when I was like hiking the Grand Canyon and it was like I was so fit and like long hair and it was like just this reminder of the body I used to have. I was just looking at like, oh, my God, I had so much energy. I could go camping. I could get out of bed. Oh, I hate my body now. And I was like, whoa, this is happening. So I just, I invite people to get rid of the photos of your old self they're the reminders of the old you. It's a reminder of what you've lost. And yes, it's loss and we need to grieve. But a part of that process is maybe take some new photos of yourself where you mm. look good and you feel good and have them around your house or turn off the reminders on Facebook. You know, we it's really difficult to process what we've lost when we keep getting reminded <laughs> of what we've lost. And I think um, a, a stepping stone to body acceptance and body love is, you know, find some clothes, even if you need to buy a different wardrobe or borrow things off friends or go to a thrift store, or secondhand store, just find something with a really nice material that you feel good in and take some photos in that, you know, have that around your house. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, um, it's a very small thing, but it's, it, help can help create that shift you know get rid of those reminders oh oh i love that uh quick question someone's asking about the link for the book so apparently if i post something it will not go out (laughs) to linkedin it will go to youtube so um if my amazing partner could take that little link i just put in the chat and put that on linkedin i would really appreciate it but no matter what after we will have all all of those links there All right, so I want to go to tip number two that I really loved. And again, she has way more tips than we're able to cover, but this is another one I really, really liked because I never heard it before. So I think a lot of people who get cancer are told to keep a food diary, or if you're having any food issues, you know, you're told to keep that food diary. Keep, I mean, I know I've done it and everything, but I've never heard this quite phrase like this before keep a fatigue diary. I Mm. thought it was. Brilliant. So tell us why we should do that. So this is very OT. We're trained (laughs) in energy conservation and pain management and fatigue management. So it's a very, very OT related uh, section of the book. But our energy impacts everything, (laughs) everything, as well as our desire, as well as Mm -hmm. our enjoyment, as well as our pleasure. Um, And fatigue and cancer are, woof, yeah, they go hand in hand and fatigue can last years after treatments. You know, it's not, it's not a, oh, chemo's finished, I'm, I'm fine now. Um, and so that can actually be the main barrier between people connecting and being, and being intimate again and sexual again. So a really neat trick is I actually did this with pain as well. Um, I tracked my fatigue and, and my pain. Uh, like, so I just kept a diary and I used a number system, you know, and so it would be like, okay, I'm a four out of 10, uh, in the morning. Uh, I'm actually a two out of 10 when I went for a walk and I'm like, oh, I'm an eight out of 10 at the end of the day. And what I did, like, it helps you find patterns. And so it'll help you find the, the day, the time in the day or the time in the week where you're less tired and you have more energy. And that can help you then intentionally plan time with your partner, you know, so you can use your energy, that that sweet spot of don't worry about going to the shops, find a shortcut, get someone to do that for you, get intimate with your partner or yourself instead, you know, because it's about living, you know, that, that saying, it's about living, not surviving. Like intimacy yes. is a really big part of living and the fatigue, I, I have, I just need to share, I have the worst fatigue at the moment I'm insomniac from my treatments I'm I'm struggling um and the 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 diary it's just it's just helping me so much so it's not just me saying you should do this I'm like I'm doing this and it's helping me why it's why it's in the book (laughs) (laughs) what patterns have you identified for yourself lately um oh god exercise is good (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you do say that in the book, okay? Oh, it's so good and it's so horrible because it's, it's so true. Exercise. It is. <laughs> it is. I, I, you know, I actually just want to add to you for for women if you're struggling with desire, exercise is really good. Oh, it's yoga, really good. Blood yeah. flow, all the joints moving. It's it's breath. It's strength uh, building. Yoga is amazing for sexual function, by the way. Again, it's getting the pelvis moving, getting blood yep. flow. Um, so my patterns are <laughs> at the moment they're pretty bad, but the mornings are like right now. This is my energy moment, and I'm, a, I'm about to crash. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven a.m. is is the time where I'm on the couch, and then I'll, I'll eat something. I'm struggling to eat at the moment, and and then at one, I'll 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 have some. I'll be able to like see a client or do some online stuff, and then I'll have to like have another break. And then I might be able to do something like go for a walk or see a partner. And then after dinner, I am useless. Like even though I'm I'm wide awake in my brain, insomnia, um, my body is just a mess. So there's like that, there's that disconnect too. You know, you could be wide awake, you could be very functional in your brain, but your body's like, no, nope, no, nope, can't do that. So I, I'm very sporadic. I need to have rest breaks throughout the day. Uh, and the fatigue diary helped me figure that out, and it's it's saving me. I'm I'm I live alone. I support myself. Um, so I think without the fatigue diary, I I I don't know where I'd be living to be honest. It's the thing that's helped me got through all of it. Oh, and I would recommend that for anyone, anyone mm. struggling. If you're struggling um, with sleep, I have a terrible time sleeping. I always have, um, but it's strange. But my best time of day is actually 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for creative endeavors. Like that's my best time to write and create content. And, and that's why I don't like to do email in the morning. Cause to me, that doesn't take a lot of creativity and I can do that in the afternoon. That's (laughs) really good. I like it. it. (laughs) Now Tess has some, even on the Kindle version, you can see them. It's really cool. She has some graphs in the book, these little, these little X, Y things. And so I'm going to have her tell us what is the sexy Goldie Goldilocks zone. Another thing just cracked me up. Love it. Uh, I'm a bit of a sci-fi nerd. So I'm using like (laughs) planetary intergalactic language of the, yeah, you don't need to hear about that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Focus test. So, so talking about libido and arousal, uh, the wanting versus the enjoying. Um, what treatments very commonly do to us is it actually delays our arousal responses. What that means is it just it takes longer for us to get into it. But because maybe we are not really enjoying things and we're not really having those like lusty feelings and it's like oh. People think that they don't want sex anymore, that they hate sex and they don't enjoy sex anymore. But really, it's just we just need more time to enjoy it. We need our brain and our body. We need a little bit more time to connect so then those arousal responses can happen and that, that means we're enjoying it. So the Goldilocks zone is when both of you are at the same level of enjoying and that's when intimacy is going to be good for both of you. And that's when you're going to want it more. So the graphs, I'm such a nerd. So I, I <laughs> ask you in the book, like, get a pen and paper and we're going to draw a really simple graph and we're going to draw your arousal response and, and then you cover it and you put it, your, you compare what you've got with your partner and you find the gap. And what it looks like is, I'm going to be very general here, but mostly with my clients and myself, I'm like a flat line where I'm not aroused for ages, like this is time passing, and then all of a sudden, maybe like thirty minutes in, I'm like, "Woof! Oh, okay, I hockey really, stick. really, yeah, I like this." Because before chemo and cancer treatments would be like two minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I was like, "What's wrong with me? I don't. I like why? Why do, I don't like sex anymore?" But just need a bit more time. So it's about brainstorming. So like, I, I write a list of suggestions in the book on how can you get to the Goldilocks zone when one person's aroused faster than the other, when one person's enjoying it a lot more. All that means is this person gets to give this person more attention. Yum. 
And so that could be like a massage. It could be kissing. It could be soft touch on someone's back. Not genital focused. It's about connection and giving people time to relax and get into their body. Again, the brain, sex organ. And so that's the Goldilocks zone. And it's it sounds quite simple, massage and back touch, but it's amazing. And then it's wonderful for partners as well. They're like, oh, I'm I'm not bad at sex now. It's just my partner just needs more time and more attention. And I know it can be tricky to receive. You know, you're not a selfish lover. You just, you just, your body reacts differently now and you're working with that and it's amazing. Um, so the Goldilocks zone is both of you enjoying. I love it. And I, I've never heard it described that way before. I've heard it, well, the person who has the low sex drive is the one in control. There's low sex drive, high sex drive, and, and that person, whoever has the low sex drive is in control of that physical relationship, which is ridiculous and, and, and yeah. very unsettling if you're on the other side of that. Um, but I, I really love the, the yeah. sexy Goldilocks zone. Uh, all right. So I, I think people are being shy. We can see that you're here. So just, <laughs> you know, again, you can post a question and then you can delete it right away. But um, again, if you have any questions for Tess, um, if you do this, after we're done, please make sure to tag her, especially on LinkedIn. Otherwise, she'll never know that you had a question and reach out to her on LinkedIn and her Facebook mm. group. So we're going to get to my very favorite line in the book, which was hard because I had a lot. But this one just, I i laughed so hard I almost cried. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I, I almost feel like this should be the second title of the book, but you need to follow it up with this one. So. <laughs> Sex is toast and lube is the spread. Oh my gosh. Love, 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 love. So funny. So funny. And so tell us based on our bodies and what's going on, which type of lube we should use. Mm. There's so many types. <laughs> so there's water-based, wax-based, oil-based, silicon-based, sterile, hybrid, and then between them, there's um, glycerin, blending. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll get to glycerin in a <laughs> in a little bit, but um, <laughs> people. Firstly, lube is not something to be used when you're not well or when you're experiencing pain. Use actually, lube actually just makes everything better. That's why I'm like, sex, sex is toast. Lube is the spread. Lube is the <laughs> thing that makes the toast good. <laughs> no? And uh, now that I'm saying this out loud, I'm realizing that the toast could actually be a comparison to a dry vagina, which is it is, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh no, oh no, I just realized that, and that's funny because I have I have atrophy from my treatment, so that that is me right now. <laughs> oh my god, god. Um, but yeah, lubricants. We're told go water based. Yes, I we before I, we went live, I told you I was always told go water based because I'm prone to yeast infections, or I was, yeah. and you just don't you want it to be based in water. But tell us why water based isn't necessarily a great idea. You described it so well. Yeah, so it can be good for some people, but so the human body, you know, we're over ninety percent water. Uh, the human body is designed to absorb water. That is what you know. We eat food and like. All the water is absorbed in our guts. When we're not well or just in general, our vaginal canal and our rectal canal is designed to absorb water. So if you're using a water-based lubricant, it just gets sucked up really quickly like a sponge, yeah. which is fine, but you just need to keep topping it up, which can be interruptive. Or for people that aren't familiar with losing, using lubricants, they think using putting it on once is enough. enough. <laughs> but what happens is when it gets absorbed into the body, the remnants of the ingredients of the lube uh, can create a film inside the canal, which can create more friction. So they're not so necessarily, yeah. So wax, oil, silicon, hybrid, and um, particular sterile lubes, they last longer in the human body. They're slicker longer. Uh, and particularly wax, um, for people that are experiencing discomfort, it, it creates a protective layer. So it's pretty amazing. Um, it's about finding what's right for you. And if you do, if you're prone to UTIs and yeast infections, it might be worth looking at sterile lubricants that aren't purely water-based. So you could have a silicon 
spirits and water hybrid. Hybrid just means blend. Um, you could use a sterile hybrid. So again, it's not pure water, so it won't get sucked up quickly, but it's sterile, like it's very pure and it's what um, people use in hospitals. So the, there's options as well. I mean, so I don't want to tell you what to use because we are all different and it's definitely worth exploring. But if you are someone who has, say, um, vaginal atrophy or genital eczema, I, I can't, I don't have, I don't have commission in this product, by the way. I'm not <laughs> trying to make a sale, but um, it's like, it sounds really dodgy, like buy this thing. Um, there's a product called Olive and Bee created by a pelvic physiotherapist and it's pure wax and olive oil and it's just sensational. I use it, I have to use dilators every day because my canal is, my vaginal canal is closing due to my treatment. So dilators in the shower every day and I use olive and bee every day and it's just so wonderful but again be careful if you are prone to utis and yeast infections because the vagina is a flushing it has a self-cleaning system and the wax might be difficult to flush out and that could increase your risk of say thrush same with oil-based lubricants too silicon's a bit better but yeah you got to find what's right for you okay that's good to know i learned so much i did <laughs> So here's another point I, I love. Um, we're going to save the last tip for last. We're going to go a little bit over, um, but Tess is going to crash on us in 18 minutes. So I'm going <laughs> to speed it up a little bit. So explain for us why we need time and repetition. Repetition, Like what, what does that do in the brain? Another visual analogy coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, imagine that your brain... And the imagine lots of pieces of string that connect your brain to the parts of your body and some of them are sensation and some of them are function. And so for things like intimacy or in sensation, we'll go with sensory feedback for the moment. So you haven't touched yourself or a partner hasn't touched you in a very long time. What happens is the connections, those, those pieces of string, they get smaller. So it's kind of like the, this is use it or lose it, by the way. This is where this motto where actually comes from. applies. Yeah. yeah, it's neuroplasticity. So the more you engage in something, the larger the sections in your brain get. So that's why we kind of forget a language if we don't use it all the time because our brain's like, oh, I don't need that anymore. I'm going to focus on learning karate now, you know, and so that was a really bad example. Um, <laughs> no, the language is good though. Cause there was a short yeah. time in my life where I could speak conversational Spanish because I had yeah. to for my job. And yeah. yeah, now all I've got is como esta. That's it. That's, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I was just about to say bien in response to <laughs> French. My... <laughs> so ne neuroplasticity mm -hmm. is, uh, so imagine, okay, there's a, a dirt bike bicycle track. And there's weeds covering it and grass. And that's that's your pleasure, that's your arousal, that's your sensitivity, that's your desire. And because it's a little neglected, because it's been a while since you've tended to the path, like it's it's pretty hard to find, you know, and you, you know, there's weeds all over. It's just, you know, it's a very, very small path. But then if we go back to using that path, the weeds disappear, you find you find the track more and the, and it gets larger. So that that little dirt dirt track becomes a six lane highway. So repetition is growth. So our brain, we can't do something once and our brain doesn't latch onto it. Unfortunately, neurological change is very slow, hmm. but it's very effective. So that's why I'm always banging on about, yeah, repetition and, and touch and getting rid of that goal. So we can create new sensory pathways with repetition of touch and in and focus, we have to focus. If when if we're like touching our arm and watching TV, <laughs> nothing, nothing is going to happen up here. We're like, oh, that feels nice, but there's no there's no neurological neurological change happening. So rep repetition is the key, and I mean repetition of anything. So maybe you decide to to kiss your partner a bit more. 
that's going to increase your pleasure pathways, even just that little thing, because you're going to be reminded, oh, I am a vessel of pleasure. I like being touched. I like intimacy. (laughs) And then, you know, even just tiny little things like that. But because it's a slow, because it's slow, um, I guess people think that it doesn't work. But it's so much going on in the background. And then all of a sudden, four weeks later, you're like, oh, did I just? Did I just have an orgasm from my lower back? Like, <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. So it's um repetition is is key. <laughs> well, that uh, goes right into our next one. Um, talk about erogenous zones. <laughs> so our entire body can be an erogenous zone, totally um, and I know that we're told what is it like chest buttocks genitals I think they're the they're the ones that yeah. we're told like we're taught or shown in movies um and we can lose our erogenous zones you know so I've I've had a breast removed so that's a loss that's a loss of um what used to be a very very erogenous zone for me oh again I'm so sorry I just it's all neuroscience um but you can create new ones so in brain injury in the stroke ward someone would have a stroke and say that they they would have um, their left side would be affected so I would teach them through neuroplasticity how to move their arm again but I would also teach them how to have sensation again Mm. I would reconnect the pathways very slowly with repetition and touch and intention why can't we do the exact same principles on any other part of our body but for pleasure so it's the exact same thing. It's science. It's clinically proven. Um, it's just for a different outcome, which is pleasure. So I guess that's why it's taboo. But again, you know, uh, I, I overshare coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, everyone. But as an example, yeah. So I, I lost, I lost my primary erogenous zone. But now my inner thighs. Oh my lord! And what I did was I would. In, in states of pleasure or even with myself, you know, because it's repetition, got to keep at it every day, even if it's just two minutes. And when I was in a really relaxed, calm state, I would just softly touch my inner thighs and I would just think to myself, oh, that's really nice. Oh, that feels like I really like that. That's it. And I just kept doing it. And then sometimes if I was in pleasure with a partner, I'll be like, oh, can you can you touch my inner thigh? And I'll be like, oh, that's right. I love this. And then my brain would associate that part of my body to intimacy and then it just became an erogenous zone. So I guess it's oh. a way of saying it's not, it's not the end if you have had a body part removed and you've lost sensation. There are other ways. It just takes a bit of time and a little bit of focus. Oh, I, t- I totally agree. I I have a lot of erogenous zones that that I know exist, but there's one that's absolutely not, no, nothing, and it's my ears. Like I just can't oh. even stand for my ears to be touched. Now I'm going to quickly overshare before we wrap up. And I went on this <laughs> date one time, and uh, and we only had the one date, and this is why. Um, and he went to kiss me, and I thought, you know, he's going for the lips. He went for my ear. And... <laughs> Like straight in, like, and I just, I said, I don't like that, you know. I'm, I'm, but that's, I just anything with the ear, it's okay. And went to kiss me again. He went for the ear again. I was like, you need to go. Oh. <laughs> you need to leave. The <laughs> ear, no- yeah. For some, it's an amazing part of, um, yeah, sexuality, and, so, and the neck just underneath the oh, ear. Oh, no, neck is okay. Yeah. Neck is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we are wrapping up here before LinkedIn cuts us off. So there's another tip that Tess has that I think is awesome and that we all need to do. And and I love this because you're kind of getting out the taboo of it, but you say to say the word sex 10 times aloud. Why is that? We're scared to talk about it. And if we can't talk about it, we can't address it and we can't influence change. Um, so... I ask in the book, I ask you to say sex out loud 10 times 
in stupid voices and stupid faces to yourself <laughs> or to other people in the room. And it's just a, it's just a, you know, and then, and then I'm like, okay, you, you said sex 10 times, look around, you know, the roof hasn't collapsed, That's the right. world hasn't exploded. It's just a word, you know, but it can be awkward, clunky, funny, you know, it's just, it's a way to kind of normalize this, this word that has so much stigma and shame around it. Yeah. And you say actually very early in your book that sex is messy and clumsy and I love it. So true. Yeah. You don't see that in the movies, but so true. So true. Um, all right. So before we wrap up, Tess, can we do the say sex 10 times aloud? Can we do yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know about, I, I can't do voices. I, you know, I need to make okay. my partner, my partner do this, but I, I will try to be goofy. Okay. All right. And if you're watching you this it? later in the privacy of your home, you can do this with us too. It's not a big deal. Okay. Are ready? we going to do it in the, at the same time? Yeah. Let's try it at the same time. Okay. Ready? On, on, on three. One, okay. two, three. Sex, 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 Okay, you make great faces. Sex. Her faces are so much There you go. I need to do it better because there's like this two or three second delay. So it's like, it's making me laugh even harder. Oh gosh. And see, all I did, it made me laugh. So she's right. It's not going to kill you. The roof is not going to fall in, you know. Yeah. So I want to finish with this. And I just also want to emphasize that um, we will have all the links, but I really, really encourage you to get Tessa's book. Um, we do have the link in one of the chats, but the book again is A Better Normal, Your Guide to Rediscovering Intimacy After Cancer. You Google that and her, it's definitely going to come up, go to Amazon. She also has a private Facebook group and I will ask her afterwards how we can put a link to that um, because you do have to be accepted into the group. And, um, and then we have some, some other fun resources and links and, um, the, the olive and B one, we'll make sure we put a link to that as well. So, um, I want to put this last thing up. I, I felt like this was so beautiful and, and all funny and kidding aside this, um, this really spoke to me. So I would love to wrap up with this and then give Tess the last word. Sex is your body, your connection, your arousal your pleasure, your touch, your giving, and your receiving. And I couldn't agree more. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's a, it's that pressure of sex needs to be a certain way. And yeah. if, if our bodies don't work that way anymore or we're just not familiar with how our body works and that, that, that way that you have done sex before might be different it's people think that that's the end, but yeah. pleasure is endless. Our body is capable of so much. We just need to, to take a step back and think of it like starting from scratch, which is why, you know, remove the goal. Like that's yeah. why I always say that in the book, repetition, connection, intimacy. Um, yeah, and, you know, giving and receiving. It doesn't always have to be two-way. You can offer someone pleasure and that can be extremely pleasurable for you, especially if your body is not doing what you want it to at the time. And also flipping it, you know, receiving can be so wonderful. Someone's really enjoying giving you this experience. So there's, there's a lot to it. Sex is, there, there's been studies where people have tried to define the word sex and they've gotten nowhere. <laughs> So, really yeah yeah it's um it's so complicated because it's so broad you know yeah. all of our bodies are completely different and we respond differently because it's like neurology so um yeah we haven't been able to define it yet oh gosh oh Tess thank you so much for coming on to this live interview very different than what we did last time and <laughs> if you're watching and you leave a comment, please, please be sure to tag Tess. Otherwise, she will not see the comment. People often leave comments days and weeks later. So Tess, thank you again. Thank you so much. Also, this is what it looks like. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah. Look for the love heart. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This is fun in my peak moment of the day. <laughs> That's right. That's right. She suggested the time. So if you're watching this right now, it's uh, it's almost six o'clock Eastern time on Thursday. And what time is it for you? It's 9.55 a.m. on Friday, World Cancer Day. That's right. Oh, God. I don't, we didn't plan it that way either. I don't think so. No, no we didn't. <laughs> happy, happy All right. Thank you, thank you so much. Go get Tess's book. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.